The next talk is Overcoming Cognitive Bias, Bias? Bias? by Anna Martelli Ravenscroft. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How many people here are here for, at PyCon Italia for the first time? Wow. Welcome, all of you. So that's awesome. Um, so I am referencing in this talk to some talks I gave previous years. So if you want to go look up the videos online so you get more context, that'll be great. Um, just wanted to let you know if you're like, what? Then that, that's what I'm talking about is talks from last year's keynote or the year before. All right. I'm Anna Martelli Ravenscroft. My husband and I wrote Python in a Nutshell, third edition. Uh, I'm a PSF fellow. I am a uh, gr graduate from Stanford with a degree in cognitive science. So I'm going to be talking about cognitive bias, talking about ways our brains trick us into things that we might not want our brains to be doing. So let's see if I can get this to work. Yay. All right. So our brains basically are lazy. They want to use the least bit of energy they can to get the job done. So they use heuristics. Our brains do automatic pattern matching, which is pretty cool when it works. And our brains fill in the blanks, which is also really cool when it works. Unfortunately, sometimes it leads to mistakes. So if you see lots of pictures of cute, fluffy white doggies, aww, and then you see another cute, fluffy white doggie behind a brick wall, you will recognize that there's a cute, fluffy white doggie back there, right? Your brain just fills in the blanks except sometimes it doesn't work. It's a kitty. So pattern matching gotchas, you see things that don't actually exist. You see patterns that don't exist. Things like superstitions are because of those pattern matching gotchas. Your brain sees a pattern that isn't really there. Faulty reasoning, stereotyping, false assumptions about individuals based on patterns you've built up, either personally or culturally, that don't fit with that person. So speaking of patterns, let's, we're at a computer conference, so let's look at some computers and programs, programmers. Ada Lovelace, as mentioned, was the first programmer. She wrote an algorithm to calculate Bernoulli numbers for a computer that didn't even exist yet, as mentioned in the last slide, or the last talk. How many computers do you see in this picture? Anyone see any computers in this picture? <laughs> Women were the human computers, the the women were computing or calculating things at observatories for the military until electronic computers were developed. This is the ENIAC. How many programmers do you see here? Any guesses? Shout it out. Five, two, the one who said two is right. The women were the programmers. As uh, Alicia mentioned, the uh, machines were the manly part, the hardware. Women were doing all that typing stuff. Actually, back then, they were reading the circuit diagrams and figuring out which switches and which wiring they needed to do to program it. Meanwhile, in Bletchley Park, fighting the Nazis, women were programming the computers that were cracking the codes. At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the 50s, women were the computers 
still manual computing for lunar missions, for satellites, for planetary exploration. And then you notice that not all of these women are white. There were black women also working at JPL. And then you have Katherine Johnson, who is the star of Hidden Figures, who was a computer. And John Glenn, the first American who to uh, go around orbit the uh, Earth, he asked her to verify what that electronic computer was coming up with, because he trusted her calculations more than that newfangled machine. She is an awesome person. She and her cohort learned to program those electronic computers. They were learning Fortran and going out and programming those electronic computers. Mary Ellen Wilkes designed the operating system for the link, which is arguably the first personal computer in the home. Adele Goldberg developed Smalltalk. Elizabeth Feinler in 74, she helped plan and run the Network Information Center for the ARPANET, the forerunner to the internet. Frances Allen, she is an awesome lady. You gotta meet her. She is the coolest lady ever. Um, she's an IBM fellow for laying the groundwork for parallel com computing. And of course, there's the amazing Grace Hopper. She's done so much. She founded microcomputer co conferences so that, which are the forerunners to all of our conferences that we love to attend. She invented COBOL, the compiler and developed COBOL. She documented the first bug, which was actually a moth in the wiring. And nowadays, we have the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, which has thousands of women show up every year to talk about software design, sysadmin, DevOps, all of those technical subjects we all love to talk about with other women. And these four lovely ladies worked on the LIGO and Virgo project to uh, find gravitational waves. We saw some of their uh, work last year. Uh, it was done in Python, and these ladies worked on it. And then there's my friend Kay. Kay is a scientist. Kay builds lasers. She's really cool. She does really cool stuff with lasers. But she's not a programmer. If you ask her, she'll say, I'm not a programmer. So what's that belong in? Why does she belong in our slides? What do you ask someone you meet at a technical conference like PyCon? Where do you work? Is it a Python shop? What's your favorite programming language or what's your favorite package? How do you use Python? What do you ask a woman that you meet at a technical conference? Chances are, you ask her, are you a programmer? Are you a recruiter? Are you here with your boyfriend? I've heard all these. Uh, I'm running a community survey, and so far of the answers, every single woman has heard these questions. Some of the men, but less than half of the men, every single woman. And what it implies is, do you belong here? And there's a reason for that, and we'll get into that. Now, my friend Kay, if you ask her, are you a programmer, she'll say no, because she's not. She designs la lasers. She's a scientist. But if you ask her, do you use any programming? She uses Python and NumPy and Matplotlib and Pandas, and she could probably run circles around most of us on those kind on the uh, data science stuff that she's using. She's not a programmer, though. She, but is she a Pythonista? I'd say yeah. So, the title was overcoming cognitive bias. 
And let's talk about that specifically here. So if you remember our cute fluffy puppies, they're so cute. And then our kitty who's masquerading as a puppy. If your conference looks less like that than like that, if you're surrounded at work and at conferences by mostly young to middle-aged white guys, then your pattern of what a programmer looks like is going to be middle-aged white guys, young white guys. That's because that's how your brain works. It develops patterns, they, and your brain's pattern match automatically. It's not you're a bad person, it's your brain works that way. All of our brains work that way. I self-select out for a long time from being a programmer because I wasn't a white guy. I'm white, but I'm not a guy. I'm not a male. So therefore, I'm not a programmer because programmers are males. Um, if all the programmers you encounter look like a white male, then anyone who doesn't look like that white male doesn't fit the pattern. So because it's how our brains work, if you're surrounded by this, then when you see this billboard on the side of a bus, my team is great, everyone is smart and creative and hilarious from uh, written by a platform engineer, then what you're gonna expect to see as the picture is not this. In fact, there was so much pushback from this particular ad that she created a hashtag, I look like an engineer. Because so many people said, wait, that doesn't look like an engineer. Doesn't look like a white guy, but it does look like an engineer because she is an engineer. And so are all these people. And so we have to overcome this pattern. And there's ways to do that. So when you ask a woman at a conference, are you a programmer? It is cognitive bias at work. That stereotyping, that automatic pattern matching, it's cognitive bias. But we're a meritocracy. We only care about performance, right? That's what we say. Sorry, but probably not. There's a thing called confirmation bias. Now, if you have this rule, a card has a vowel on one side, then it must have an even number on the other side. Obviously, you want to check the A to see if there is an even number on the other side. But what other card would you want to turn over to check, to test this? Yeah. We're programmers, and we've been trained to do that. We've been trained to look for things that don't match, that try to disprove, that try to break the rule. So a lot of people will say, oh, the four, because they expect to see a vowel on the other side. The four doesn't answer anything. It's called confirmation bias. Our brains look for ways to prove what we already believe. If you only test, I heard this yesterday, if you only test for handling expected input, you only know how the code handles the expected. And a lot of newbies will do this. They'll test to make sure it works the way they expect it to, instead of doing the edge cases and the corner case and all of that stuff to see how it breaks, how it deals with the stuff that you don't want. There's other cognitive biases besides confirmation bias and stereotyping. There's in-group bias, which is the tendency to favor members of your own group. Projection bias, believing that other people have the same beliefs and priorities as you do. Uh, if you ever heard someone tell you when you're coding, you are not the user, you have to find out what the users actually want, that's because of projection bias. 
you can't decide that you can think like the user. The user thinks completely differently from you. Uh, selective perception. Uh, if you watch my video from last year, you'll see an example of this where you only see the things you're expecting to see. And status quo bias, we want things to stay the same. It's comfortable if it's the same. So at work, university faculty hiring committees tend to be really liberal. They tend to be very focused on diversity. Somebody that back there asked a question about hiring and wanting to hire people fairly. So they did a study and they sent identical resumes out, some with male names and some with female names. And the resumes with women's names were judged more critically, more harshly than identical resumes with men's names, even by the women because we all have these patterns that we've built up. In fact, some of the resumes by women, their research that was listed, oh, I bet her advisor helped her with that. They didn't say that about the men. Orchestras, for a long time, were male only. And they wanted to change that. And so they said, how can we change it? Because we're seeing people, and you know, we have to watch them while they're auditioning. Oh, but wait, we can put up a screen so we don't see them. And what that did was it made them hire more people of color, but it didn't really increase the number of women being hired until they figured out what do women wear on their feet when they are dressed up. Heels? What do heels sound like walking across a stage? Sounds different from a man's feet, doesn't it? Especially if you're a musician and you're used to listening. So even that subtle cue of the women's heels was enough to change how they were perceiving the music the performance. When they put down carpets to muffle the sound, there was parity in hiring between women and men. That subtle of a cue changed perception. It's not that they chose to not hire the woman because she's a huh, woman. They judged her differently. They perceived it differently because they knew it was a woman. Not because they wanted to, but because that's how our brains work. So if you see, if you're used to seeing a bunch of white guys, as that's what a programmer is, and that's the pattern you've built up in your head, when you see this person, you may say, that's not really, that doesn't fit my pattern. And then your brain is going to say, well, why doesn't this person fit the pattern? There must be something wrong. And you will look for proof for why this person doesn't really belong because they don't match the pattern. It's an automatic reaction. You will be more critical of errors and weaknesses. You will give less credit to strengths and abilities. You will perceive them differently. This isn't because you're a bad person, it's because it's how our brains work. And we all do this. Cognitive bias is getting in the way of our meritocracy. So how do we overcome this cognitive bias? With awareness and conscious effort. You've all been woke now. You've all been made plenty aware of this existing. We've had talks all through this. Our talk from our lovely speaker before me made you aware of it. You were probably a little aware of it before, but now you understand more of why it's working that way. So now it's the conscious effort part. This is a hard problem. It actually requires work just like any bug fix. So how do you overcome stereotypes? 
work on welcoming and mentoring new Pythonistas, reach out to marginalized groups, encourage those things like the pie ladies and the uh, tech girls and the women who code. And, and I saw we've got some people here from Africa who you may not have interacted from, with before, which is wonderful actively work to bring in marginalized programmers and Pythonistas to conferences and user groups and get organizations to sponsor people who aren't like you. Encourage people who aren't like you to attend conferences, to learn to code. Encourage people who aren't like you to speak at conferences. And this way you actively challenge those patterns you've subconsciously built by offering your brain different input. It will overwrite those patterns if you surround yourself with people who challenge those patterns, who don't fit those patterns, and actively seek them out. In hiring, avoid gendered ads. There's an app for that. So you can, this is English only, I believe, but you can run your ad through these apps and find out if the app tends to make women less likely to even apply. In hiring at your HR when you're looking at resumes, do blind resumes where possible for the people evaluating. Remove the name and other clues to what group they're a member of. So you might need to remove the university. Because really, who cares what university they went to? What you need to know is what their skills are, what their experience is. Focus more on skills than on culture fit. Use technology. There's apps out there that will help you get more people. And when you're interviewing people who are members of marginalized groups, look first for reasons to hire. This will help short circuit that tendency to be hypercritical and judge more harshly. So instead of looking for reasons to weed them out, look for reasons to hire them. I'm not saying lower your standards. I'm saying look for why they do fit your standards. Actively look for their strengths and weakness, their strengths and abilities, because we know that we will tend to not do that, so we have to actively override that. And watch out for imposter syndrome in your candidates. Uh, everyone know what imposter syndrome is? It's the tendency to kind of not believe that you're good enough, not believe that you, be worried you're gonna get caught out, and so people tend to not People who have imposter syndrome may not tell you that, oh, I did this awesome thing. They'll say, oh, it was a group effort. Well, it was probably a group effort where they did 90% of the work and are only taking 10% of the credit because that's their culture or that's imposter syndrome. So if they say, oh, it was a team effort, they probably did the work. Give them credit for it. At this conference, for the rest of the conference, I have a challenge for you. I want you to seek out people who aren't like you, listen to them, presume they're just as smart and skilled as you are, believe them when they share their experiences with you, look for things you have in common. Look for their strengths and abilities. We're all at PyCon, so we all love Python. So talk about Python with them. At a technical conference, presume everyone you meet is a programmer or otherwise uses programming in their job, unless you're told otherwise by that person. Stop asking, are you a programmer? Unless you're saying, are you a programmer or a sysadmin? That's OK. Instead, ask, what kind of programming do you do? What, how do you use Python? 
or any other question you would ask someone you already assume is a programmer. And you may find out they're a lot, a lot more like you than you expected. And you don't limit the conversation to just people who self-identify as programmers. So you may learn about uses of Python you never even heard of, like cosmology, who knew? And squirrel deterrence. This guy used Python to control a camera and figure out that whether it was a squirrel at his bird feeder and then shoot a water cannon at the squirrel. It was awesome. <laughs> Working together to overcome these stereotypes and confirmation bias, we're all going to get that much closer to actually achieving a true meritocracy and making the Python community even better, and our projects better, as you've heard. After all, Python will save the world. I don't know how, but it will. <laughs>so do we have time for questions? Yes. Oh good. We have also time for questions. Okay. So questions, answers. <laughs> I'm all for answers. But <clears throat> part of the solution you have mentioned, aren't them somehow part of the problem in this sense, it, they look like the creation of reserves for native Indian in the state. Did, Sorry. It's like creating, in some cases, those solutions you mentioned, like yeah. a group for women and blah, 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 look really like the same kind of solution has been applied in the United States for native Indians, creating reserve for them. But this did not solve the problem at all. So, I don't know, in some cases, I really feel that creating groups for women is not the solution. It's you not should just dissolve completely the difference, not saying... And again, saying that women are a minority, it, it doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, for me, you should not create something special for women. Simply just dissolve completely the difference. Okay, the problem there is women's groups, doing programming only with other women. We want them all with the, the whole group. We want men and women and blacks and whites and Asians and, and Muslims and Christians and Jews and everybody all together. But when you have a whole cultural setup that says girls don't belong in programming, Girls aren't supposed to learn to code because that's men's work, then you need to start by giving them the chance to learn with other women that this is okay for me to do. And what they have found is instructors in a classroom, and I have seen this, where there are women and men in the same classroom will pay more attention to the men's questions than the women's. It happens over and over again. There's been a million studies out there showing that it happens. Also, the girls are less likely to even speak up and ask those questions if there are men in the room because they don't want to look stupid in front of the men. And so there's all these reasons why the getting them started by having girls only or women's only programming classes, things like that, makes a huge difference. So it's not instead of, it's in addition to. So you need both. And you had a comment about yeah, that. Yeah, and, and I can tell you that um, when I started out as iOS developer trying to learn it, I reached out to the males group. And when I asked them a question to help me, is that men make, men make us women feel stupid in a lot of ways when we ask those questions. So I ask if there's other women out there that can help me because women have a little bit more, we're a little bit more connected, we communicate with each other and we try to help each other the best way we can. 
And so when I asked that question, men attack me. You know, we, you know, we are one. We will work together. And it's not, it's not that we don't want y'all to help us. We want y'all to help us. It's just how you'll do it. You know, it's it's a different way of how you'll communicate with a woman when a woman communicate. We want, don't get us wrong, we want all men to help us because a lot of y'all are amazing mentors. Mm -hmm. But then again, there's some of them that just make it bad for those who want to help us and then we take, you know, we get hurt by what you've done. And that's why you see more women organizations coming out working together because there's just men that don't want to, how would you say, it kind of- Or aren't able to, phrase things in a way that doesn't come across as, wait, what? Why would you even ask that? That's a stupid question. They don't say that stupid question part aloud, but it's kind of implied in their reaction. But it's not, it's, the other part is having a lot of women around is helping to fight the societal pressure that says, oh, women aren't coders, women shouldn't be wasting their time on this. And so there's a lot of reasons why having those for women, for people of color, where they see other people like them helps to build that pattern in their head that yes, I do belong here. And so that's why we want more of that and more of everybody all together. So they're not instead of, it's an addition. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, I was wondering first if uh, all these statistics are uh, different from country to country or is just worldwide? And it's uh, mostly worldwide. Uh, mostly there's, worldwide. There's a few countries, I believe Mauritius is different because everybody started at the same time there. and But in most countries, women are way less represented in programming and in other technical yeah, I stuff. Mean, uh, so don't you think that uh, in this way you are, I mean, like we are creating like a man stereotype so that uh, if I tell you that I have, I've, I've, I have asked like, uh, are you a programmer in this conference? You think that I have asked this question to a woman, but in fact I asked it to a man. Uh, actually, if you uh, look at the statistics, I, I started doing my survey. Every woman who answered my survey has been asked that question. Less than half of the men have been asked that question. We assume the men here are here as programmers. We assume that the women here, well, maybe they're recruiters, maybe they're with their boyfriend. Well, maybe they're a programmer, but it's not the first assumption as it is for the men. This has been my experience and other women who've answered the survey. So it's not just me making it up. Yeah, no, no they are not just ex projecting my experience onto others. It's, it's actually out there. Yes. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for this information. I'm very happy to see those incredible women in science. And I, I didn't know because we all know the, the man because it's what society teach us. But I agree with him, uh, not only for women, only for homosexual or um, color yeah. groups. I don't like those groups. I like um, to, I don't know, the bro, to, to help these people uh, also in the way making these things. But for example, I make a community to help women where in this community, there are men and women who help women. So, That's cool. uh, because yeah. if I I make a community only for women, made by women, uh, it does not impact with the people who has the wrong thinking. No, if if it's for women, but inside the society there are men and women, it has another impact. So I think this yeah. is be this will be better. Um, uh, Both are good. Uh, both are good. See, because as you said, yeah. uh, when they are only women, it helps women to, to make the, the changes. But we have to change the mental of, of people, not to help women to do the things. Because women do the, the, does these things. The problem is the mental of the person. Also women, because for example, I was playing 
a game and I said to this game, this weekend I can't be here because I'm going to uh, PyCon, no? I, because I'm a programmer. The first thing that a woman said to me is, ah, you are a sexy programmer. So you think first that I'm sexy because I'm a woman and you even see me, so you don't know. And I'm cool because I'm a programmer. I am just a person who programs whatever, whatever person could do this. So I really get very angry with those okay. things. Because I would like to every people be treated as a human and not as a, I, I, a I agree. Woman. I agree it would be great if we all got treated the same, the same. way. And, and this is but the it thing. doesn't happen. Right. And we're statistically. About, and this is the thing. In America, okay, so we're not talking about here. Mm -hmm. In America, we as women, minorities, Underrepresented are treated differently. Okay. Yeah. Do you understand that? Do you yeah, really? Yeah. Do you understand that? That means that if even as a woman minority, I am not accepted in a group of men as a developer. I am disrespected, underrated. I mean, insulted. And so that to me represent why would I want to be in a group where men don't respect me? On the other hand, you also have men allies, people who have that privilege of being the white males who grew up that way and so they can say, hey, we want the women here. We want to mentor the women. We want to mentor the people of color. We want them yep. part of the yep. community. So they have a role to play. And we and so having them mentoring those groups exactly. is awesome. Yep. But having groups where there are newbies only, or groups where there are women only or people of color only, can help overcome imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and can help overcome some of those self-selecting out problems that we see over and over studies show that it happens over and over again. One of the studies that they found, uh, Carnegie Mellon had a problem with women dropping out of their computer science uh, program, their four-year program, partway through the first year. And what they found was that instead of the um, weeding out gatekeeper classes being the first class, they changed the program so it was what ones that will help them feel successful. And they also changed it so classes were divided by how the person felt about their own skills. So the women and other people who considered themselves newbies, not just women, but you know, homosexuals or artists or musicians or people who didn't have as much feeling like they're wizards, feeling like they have a lot of skills, were in one class. People who felt like they had a lot of skills already were in another class. They taught them the same information, the same stuff, and then the second year, they put them together. They had a lot more women and artists and creatives types and people who weren't represented typically there stay with the program after that first year. And at that second year when they were put together, they were right up there with everybody else because they weren't intimidated by the wizards. They weren't being, I was in a C class, C programming class, and the woman who was teaching was teaching it to the men in the class because they already knew programming languages even though it was quote unquote a beginner's class she was addressing it as okay well okay we're going to teach it as if you already know programming it was an introduction to programming class the other women in the class were totally lost and the only reason they got through the class was because i said I know Python, so I know what she's talking about when she says indexing, and explained it to the other girls while the teacher was talking. And the, the teacher said, um, is there a problem? And I said, yeah, you're not explaining this stuff. And this happens over and over again. 
And that's why having special classes for brand newbies, whether they're women, men, any underrepresented group, is really, really helpful. And also, you got to understand, even with these women groups, men come in, in a ton of men come in to mentor our women. We mm -hmm. do not say that we do not ban men whatsoever. We oh, invite no. them. We want them to come. So we're not saying it's exclusively for women. We know women need help, but women connect up together, and men come in and say, we want to help. And yes. we have tons of men mentor our women yeah. and helping them get jobs. Yeah. You know, because again, in the United States, we have many, we have hundreds of thousands of technology jobs, and it's almost like they're saving them to fill it with men. <laughs> and though there's more women, women are in technology, they have yet to try to understand this, try, let's fill these positions with women. So never think that because we are exclusively for men, women. No, 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 no. It's a group of women trying to make it in technology and men come in there and they help us. Yeah. We have events, and, what, hackathons and conferences, oh, yeah. a lot of that stuff. And men are the main ones that really help us make it happen. Yeah. Yes, I, I will, it uh, is important I, to have both women and men mentors, though, not just men being the saviors, because we want the women to see other women who are coders and, and stuff. So you want both kinds of role models and mentors. Okay, thank you. I wanted to know this because in the photograph you see only woman, so you don't know what is behind or if there is something like that. Uh, these photographs that I showed were to overcome the stereotype that only men are programmers. Okay, thank you. <laughs>